I mentioned that it wasn't our house, suggesting she should clarify. She insisted on going there anyway to prepare dinner, calling me by name. I pointed out that the locks were changed, emphasizing the separation. I hinted that perhaps after the divorce, she might end up with it. She offered dinner again, but I declined, urging her to speak her mind. However, I laid down a condition, she had to come clean to her parents about our situation for us to meet. I demanded her father to confirm his awareness of the truth, or else I wouldn't let her in. She pleaded to keep it between us, but I stood firm, threatening to involve the authorities if her father didn't contact me. Later, I shared my disappointment about a setback at work, the prospective buyer for my unique underground house had passed away in a car accident. Despite the setback, I arranged for the landscaping to be completed, determined to sell the property. Though unconventional, I believe the right buyer would appreciate its uniqueness and pay handsomely for it. As evening approached, I went for a run with Melissa at 6 o'clock, enjoying the camaraderie and the exercise. Running alone was efficient, but running with her was far more enjoyable. So, how are things at the house of Mike and Mel? I asked. Frosty as hell, she laughed. He doesn't talk to me. I don't talk to him. But you know what? I'm enjoying it. For the first time since we got married, he isn't ordering me around. I got one of those brochures from the adoption places, and I've been going through it. There aren't nearly as many stipulations concerning single-parent adoptions as there used to be. Of course, I have to find a lawyer and get the divorce settled first, but I finally realized that he needs me a lot more than I need him. I got home at 6.45 and had the feeling that I was being watched. I went into the house and showered. At 6.58, the phone rang. I picked it up and answered it. Eric, I'm really sorry, son. I understand why you're upset. I can't believe that a daughter of mine would ever behave that way. I still think that there's a chance for the two of you to work this out, though, if you're willing to forgive her and put it behind you. A few minutes later, I put the phone down and went to the door. Andrea was standing there. Can I come in? She asked. I feel so stupid asking you that. This is my house too. Let's just talk here on the porch, I said. It's a nice night and it feels good out here. Andy, we're not back together. We're only here to talk, I said. You were the one who wanted to talk to me so badly, so I'll let you go first. You tell me what you have to say, then we'll go from there. What do you want me to say, she said. I want our life back. What more is there to say? I know you still love me. It'll take us a little while to get over this and then it'll just be in the past. We've been apart now for two weeks. You've called me hundreds of times, sent your dad to talk to me, bothered me at work, lied to your parents about why we broke up, and that's all you have to say? I was getting even more upset. What do you want me to say? She asked. Nothing, Andrea, I said, standing up. I'll see you soon. I started going into the house and she grabbed my arm and started crying. She tried to force me to turn around, but I wouldn't let her pull me around. She came around to the front of me and noticed that I was crying too. Tears were falling from my eyes, rolling down my cheeks and making tiny little drop marks on the tile of the front porch. What I have to say to fix this, she shouted. All of a sudden, I lost it. I pushed her away from me harder than I ever had. I was really glad she didn't fall off the porch because I'd have probably gone to jail for assault. How? About two words, Andrea? I screamed. Number one, sorry. Have you ever said you're sorry for any of this? Are you sorry because you betrayed our marriage vows? Or are you even sorry for what you've done to us? Are you sorry for hurting me? You know, you really ripped my heart out. How about for screwing up a marriage that was probably going to last forever? I guess you don't know that word though. You know what I can see now how stupid I've been this whole time, and that brings up the second word, love, you've seen ever since we got together, Andrea. It's never been about us loving each other, it's always been about me loving you. I'm supposed to just fall down and worship the great goddess. Andrea well, screw you, Andrea. Wait a minute. Mike already did, that's why we're here. I went into the house and slammed the door. I left her out there on the porch, crying. After about 20 minutes, she rang the doorbell. I looked out the peephole and opened the door. Andrea. I'm done talking to you. Get a lawyer, you're going to need one, she said. I'm sorry, she continued, she said I do love you, and I don't want to lose you. I don't want to live the rest of my life without you. 
this isn't the way this was supposed to happen. I went back out on the porch to listen to her. Eric, I'm curious about a lot of things. I stuck a pin into an electric socket to see what would happen when I was a kid. Now I wanted to find out what having sex with someone else would be like. I found out it wasn't nearly as good. In fact, it was nothing. It was nowhere near as good as what we have. It was a mistake, but you've blown it all out of proportion. It's not like I cheated on you, and I don't consider what I did a violation of our marriage vows. I told you what I was going to do. I wanted you to be there, but you refused. I wanted it to be exciting and fun, but it was just boring. I didn't even have one shitty orgasm, just fat old Mike humping away on me. I barely even got wet, and he doesn't last very long. For that, I have to give up my house, my car, my marriage, my husband, and my happiness. That just doesn't seem fair. Entry I told you there would be consequences. I said, you just didn't listen, you never do. Everything always has to be what you want. We really didn't have much of a marriage to begin with. This was supposed to be something new for us to bring into the bedroom and try out every once in a while, she said. You try out women and bring new tricks home, and so would I. I don't want us to get bored with each other, she said. Andrea, I never wanted anyone except you. Only now you've ruined that because I don't even want you anymore, I snapped. She looked as if I'd slapped her. After ten years, I make one mistake and that's. It, please give me one more chance. I'll do anything you want. We'll go to counseling like my dad suggested. You can do anything you want for revenge or to make yourself feel better, whatever it takes. I promise this won't ever happen again. Aren't we worth one more shot? You've always said you'd do anything for me. I'm begging you, please just give me a chance. Let me have this one mistake, I swear you won't regret it ever. She looked at me, and she knew she had me. You can move back in tomorrow, I told her, but you really need to find a therapist for our counseling sessions. Her smile could have melted a glacier, and she jumped towards me. I backed away from her and put my hands up. We're not ready for that yet, I said seriously. I'll see you tomorrow. The next evening, as I finished my run, Melissa pointed to the porch. There's your wife, she said. Forgive me if I don't come up to talk to her. I know I'm going to have to eventually, but tonight just isn't the night. See you tomorrow, Mel, I said. Are you sure that's a good idea, she asked. Why wouldn't it be? We're friends now, better friends actually, because of our shared experience, I smiled. Well, I just thought that maybe Andy wants to spend more time with you, she said softly. Then she should learn to run, I said. Mel and I have nothing to do with Andy and I. I learned a lot about her through this incident, and I want things to work out between us, but I'm not sure I'll be able to. Some things you can get past, and some things are deal breakers. In this case, I'm the only one who can make that decision, and I don't have a clue. I love her so much that I ache every day that she was away. I don't know if I agreed to this because it was the right thing to do or just to stop the pain. My skin crawls when she gets close to me. I'm just not sure we can make this work. You're not sure you can make what work? asked Andy. Hello, Melissa, she said coldly. Andy walked closer to me and tried to take my hand. I moved it away from her and said, I'm not sure that we can make us work again. I'm sure enough for both of us, so you don't have to be, she smiled. Just watch, everything will be better than it was before, I promise. Nothing will ever come between us again. What the hell have you been eating? There's nothing in the fridge, she yelled. Wait, there's some salmon in the freezer. Why don't we grill it out on the deck? I'll make some rice and some veggies to go with it. Tomorrow, I'll go shopping while you're at work. We did exactly that. The first night back together was awkward beyond belief. Andy kept talking to fill every lull in the conversation. It was as if she thought that any time we stopped talking, we'd break up again. In my heart I knew that the easy chemistry we once shared was shattered. I hoped that one day we'd get it back, but I wasn't sure when or how that could ever happen. Andy started to tell me something, but her words were drowned out by a loud crash and a bunch of yelling from next door. Does that go on often? asked Andy. Almost every night, I replied. When did it start? she asked. I just looked at her like she was stupid. Oh, she answered. I guess I'm responsible for that too. But they've been married for longer than we have. They'll scream for a while to blow off some steam, and then they'll be fine. I'm sure of it. Mel is saving her money for a divorce lawyer. 
she's the one who's working. She's done with Mike for good unless something drastic happens in the next few weeks. They're done, I said. How do you know that? asked Andy. How do you know that? Andy asked. Mel told me, I replied. For a man who won't touch me and barely seems to be talking with his own wife, you seem to be pretty chummy with Melissa, snapped Andy. Everyone needs to have someone they can trust, I said. Someone to talk about their problems to. That's the point, snapped Andy. That's supposed to be me. That always was you until you became the problem and lost my trust, I said. Trust is something that has to be earned over time. When we first got together, it took a while before we came to rely on each other. It was easy then because we had no history and had never hurt each other. For over ten years, we loved each other, trusted each other implicitly, and we had a bond. We had a chemistry based on us almost knowing each other's thoughts. Our hearts beat together, Andy. I didn't care about friends or family or work or money. Nothing came before you. You came before me. I would have died for you. I had two wishes, Andy. Do you know what they were? Yes, she said sadly. All I wanted was to grow old with you and for us to have a baby or two together. I don't need to be rich. I don't need to be famous or powerful, Andy. That's all I wanted, and you screwed it up with your curiosity. Do you even remember how many nights we've sat out here, just holding each other and watching the moon? We've probably only turned that big TV on a handful of times since we moved in here, not because there's nothing on, but because we've just never needed it. That's all gone, Andy. I agreed to try this, but I'm truly not sure we can fix this. But it was only sex, and only one time. It just seems that you can't even try to get past it. I'm hurting too. I keep feeling like I'm just a broken toy to you right now. You aren't treating me like a human being who feels things and makes mistakes. You're acting like a spoiled little boy who got dirt on his fairy princess doll and doesn't want to play with her anymore because someone else touched it, she said Andy, I know that you love sex. I do too. But there's a big difference between going out and screwing a hooker and what you and I used to do. It was far more than a physical act, it was special. It was like we brought our souls closer together by sharing our bodies. And now my fairy princess has shared her body with the troll from next door. We're basically no longer exclusive, so there's nothing special about it anymore. It's become cheaper, it's something that, under the right set of circumstances, anyone can have. So, who or what will you get curious about next time, Andy? Who or whatever it is, I won't make the mistake of telling you about it, she snapped. I see what being honest got me. Next time, I'll try lying, Andy. Right now, we're only held together by the thinnest thread you can imagine. If there ever is a next time, we'd be done so fast you wouldn't even know it. You wouldn't even see me until we met in court. I was so close to dumping your cheating wife this time that I stopped talking before I said something I'd regret. Even in the dark, I could see Andy crying. I realized that I'd let my anger push me into saying things that I shouldn't have. Good night, Andy, I said. I'm sorry for the things I said. I shouldn't have said them. I guess I'm still angry about this whole thing. Maybe this wasn't a good idea. Maybe we should have gone to counseling before we moved back in together. I'm glad you let me move back, I couldn't take sleeping alone another night, she said. I'd have gone crazy. If I had to spend another day without seeing you, why do you think I came up to your job yesterday? I know it's going to take a lot of work to get you back, Eric, but I'm going to do it. I swear that things with us are going to be even better, she said. Now let's go to bed. She followed me upstairs, and when I got to the master bedroom, she came in and sat down on the bed. She pulled her shirt over her head and started taking off her clothes. Andy, what are you doing? I asked. Getting undressed so we can go to bed, silly, she smiled. Andy, we won't be sleeping together or doing anything else for a while, I said. There are plenty of bedrooms in the house, pick one. Andy tried her best to hide her tears. You aren't even trying, she said. Maybe you don't love me anymore. The next morning, I was up, showered, and almost gone before Andy got out of bed. I was backing out of the driveway when Andy came running out of the house, still in only her bra and panties. She tapped on my window, and I let it down. I left you a key on the island in the kitchen, I said. I hadn't gotten around to canceling your credit cards, so they still work. I rolled the window back up, only to have her tap on it again. You were going to leave without telling me goodbye, she asked. 
I noticed that you don't want to kiss me or touch me, but you need to say goodbye to me just to be polite. Andy, you were asleep, I said. I didn't want to wake you. I didn't sleep very well anyway, and you can wake me anytime you want, even if it's just to tell me goodbye, or good night, or good morning. Even better if you wanted to kiss me or hug me or feel me up or screw me, she said. No matter what I've done, I'm still yours, and I always will be. I know I messed up, but I am trying to fix it. When I got to work, Na asked me, are you back with Andy, kind of on a trial basis? I said, good, maybe you can get your head out of your bum now, she said. She left you a stack of messages that all say the same thing, she loves you. You must have screwed the out of her last night. Why not give her your new phone number so she can call you herself and save me any future embarrassment? When I got home that night I was feeling better. I said hi to Andy when I came in and started changing for my run. Is it okay if I invite a couple of guests for dinner? She asked Andy. It's your house too. You don't have to ask me things like that. You never did before. Actually, I was kind of glad that we wouldn't be having another awkward night alone. I met Mel coming out of her house. We were in our usual slow four-mile loop and talked all the way. I couldn't help noticing that Mel had dropped a lot of weight, especially around her tummy, and she was looking really good. I bought a new swimsuit today, she said. It's still a one-piece, but Mike's eyes bugged out when he saw it on me. He came over towards me and reached for me until I told him, if you touch me, I'll cut his balls off. How are things with you too? she asked. Weird, I answered. Our chemistry is just gone. It's like I'm starting all over with a new person, and I get so angry at her sometimes. It'll pass, said Mel. The first time Mike cheated on me, it took over six months for me to even sleep in the same room with him. Another month before we had sex, and even then, it just wasn't the same. Give it some time. When we got done, I said goodbye to Mel and started to go into the house. Andy opened the door for me and then went to talk to Mel. When I got out of the shower, I went downstairs to see what Andy had made for dinner. It smelled great. I went out onto the deck and immediately got pissed. Mike was sitting nervously in one of my lounge chairs. I told you not to ever set foot in my house again, a-hole, I snapped. Get out now. Eric, baby, I asked Mike and Melissa to come over tonight for dinner and a swim, said Andy. Please sit down. I've got some things I need to say. Melissa stood up and came over to the lounge chairs near us, and I was shocked. A month of running and not eating much had done wonders for her figure. I had trouble taking my eyes off of her. Her already large jugs were showcased in the swimsuit, nipping into to show off her now slimmer waist and flaring back out. The suit was cut very high on the bums, and her cheeks were nowhere near covered by the thin strip of material in the back. The sight of Melissa in that suit was nearly pornographic. This time there was no hiding my reaction. I hoped that Andy and Mike hadn't noticed, but Mel grinned a bit. Until recently, the four of us were the best of friends, began Andy. Mike and I did something that, while it was cheap, stupid, and not even a good mess, ended up messing up the friendship with the four of us. There were seven relationships among us as a whole, the guys, Mel and I, Mike and I, and Mel and Eric. In those two marriages, of those seven relationships, six of them have been either ruined or severely damaged. I don't think things will ever be the same among us. We may never be friends again. Maybe that's too much to hope for, but I do have a suggestion that might go a long way towards at least saving the two marriages. I don't think that's possible, Andrea said. Melissa, I feel like Eric doesn't love me anymore, and that's killing me, said Andy. I'd give anything just to have him hold me again. He hates Mike so bad, I can feel the heat from him right now. And Mel, you aren't ready to even consider forgiving Mike. Eric hates Mike because Mike had sex with me. It makes him think of me as damaged goods, and he doesn't want me anymore. You hate me too, Melissa, and you hate Mike for having sex with me. The reason this is so bad is because there's no balance to balance this out. I think that Eric and Melissa should have sex. No one said a word. You could hear crickets chirping in the background. How would that help anything? asked Mike. They're practically dating already, he snapped. She's been coming over to your house every day to go out and run or swim with him or work out with him. They even eat dinner together a lot. Not that I'm complaining because all of the workouts have her looking better than she's ever looked. I'm ashamed to admit this, but I've cheated on Melway more times then. I should have told you, Andy, that all of that was bull. I just wanted to screw you, but I'm human and I have urges, 
and I act on them. How do we know that those two haven't already been screwing and just didn't tell us? I catch her all the time staring out our kitchen window at him while she's grading her papers. Melissa and I have never done that. I said neither of us is a cheater, and I hate to admit this, but I agree with Mike. I don't see how two wrongs are supposed to make a right. If Mike stole your baseball and got it dirty, wouldn't it be fair for you to use his and get it dirty as well? Then you'd be even, and you could be friends again, said Andy. It's simplistic, but the logic fits. Let's just eat, and we'll talk about it more later, said Andy. We ate, and though we had dinner together many times before, it was different this time, even more different than you'd expect it to be. I hate Mike and would never imagine myself speaking to him again, let alone being friends. Mike didn't hate me, but he felt uncomfortable around me because he didn't know. If I were going to jump up and kick his bum at any moment or decide that I wanted to screw his wife, who he was suddenly interested in, Melissa was pissed at Mike and planning on divorcing him and adopting a child. I still didn't know how I felt about Andy but was having trouble looking away from Melissa. Melissa felt sorry for Andy, but she kept looking at me. Andy was pissed at Mike for lying to her and using her. Andy was jealous of Melissa because Mel and I were actually the only two at the table who were speaking to each other, and for once, she had the idea that someone could take away something that she wanted, namely me. After dinner, Andy cleared the table. Mike sat alone on the deck and watched as Mel and I spoke to each other out of hearing range. Mel and I decided to play with Mike and Andy's minds for a while. Melissa and I have decided to think about it, I announced. We really have become friends through all of this and are going to spend a little more time together. Maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't. Maybe we'll do it and not tell you, maybe we won't do it and we'll tell you we did, just to mess with you. Oh hell no, said Mike. I don't like that either. I sniffed Andy to quote what someone told me not too long ago, these are our bodies, and we can do what we want with them. I said tomorrow night Mel and I are going out together. Maybe when we get back it will have happened. Maybe it won't. Why can't you just take her upstairs and screw her now? Mike let's just get this over with. I really don't like this, Andy. This isn't fair. Why not, I asked, did you have to do it your way and then brag about it afterwards? You couldn't wait to tell me how you'd done it, and it wasn't any good. It didn't mean anything, did it? And then you expected me to just let it go and say, oh, Andy, you were right, everything is just fine. But everything isn't fine, is it, Andy? And everything may never be fine again. So, Mel and I are going to do this our way. We want just like you did, only this time it will be the cheaters who are sitting home hurting, I said, but there's a difference here, said Andy, with me and Mike, it was just sex. Mike thinks that I'm a spoiled witch and he wouldn't put up with me in a million years, he just wanted to screw me because I have a nice body. I think Mike is a disgusting slob, and I'm not attracted to him at all. I just wanted to screw someone other than Eric for one goddamn time. Melissa, deny it if you want to, but you like my husband. I'm not just talking about sex here, you're attracted to Eric, and he hasn't been able to look away from your jugs, your bum, or your face all night. There is a real danger here of you two liking this too much, so I agree with Mike. You two should just screw now and get it over with, or forget the whole idea. I've been through too much trying to get my husband back to just give him away to you. Melissa and I looked at each other and moved in closer to each other, then we wrapped our arms around each other as Andy looked on in horror, and tears appeared in the corners of her eyes. I have to admit, she felt really good, amazing, in fact. Then we brought our faces close together, pushed away from each other, and shook hands. See you tomorrow, Mel, I said. Don't forget we're shooting for five miles. I grabbed a beer off the table and headed upstairs. Well, I've got papers to grade, said Mel as she headed next door. Mike and Andy just stood there with their mouths open. A little while later, Andy knocked on the door of my room. Can we talk, she asked. I guess, I answered. She came into the room wearing a long robe that covered everything. That was a first. She'd obviously been crying again. I'm going to get you an escort. She said, what the hell are you talking about now, Andy? I asked. Well, it's only right that you get to screw someone else to make up for what I did, but. I don't want it to be Melissa, she said. I still have no clue what you're talking about, Andy. There's something going on between you and Melissa. You may not see it, she may not see it, but trust me, it's there, and it scares the out of me, Eric. All my life I've been the pretty girl. I always knew I could have any guy I wanted. 
I never had to worry about losing a boyfriend to anyone else, even though I didn't put out. This is hard for me to admit, but until tonight, I never took Melissa seriously. I mean, she's always been kind of borderline pretty, but she's shorter and chunkier than I am. She has big jugs, but I have everything else. Her gut was kind of a turnoff, but now my marriage is crumbling, and stress and worrying about what I may have lost has been hard on me. I'm not looking my best, and Melissa has somehow lost that gut and toned up crazily. Even I had to admit tonight she looked really good in that swimsuit, and you noticed it too. Mike is really pissed, and he doesn't want you anywhere near her. You two spend way too much time together. I'm really afraid that with your anger towards me and your so-called friendship with her, that I could lose you. She said I realize now that I've been kind of selfish during our marriage and took you for granted, but that's over now and it won't happen again. I promise, I know that I don't have the right to ask for any favors, but I'm begging you for this one. If you have to have your revenge sex, I'll get you anyone you want, a model, an athlete, a hooker, a porn star like Britney Spears, or a goddamn circus clown. I'll even try and hook you up with my sister if you want anybody except Melissa. She said I started laughing and the sheet pulled down a bit, revealing my chest and the upper region of my stomach. Andy looked and I heard her sigh quietly, and I suddenly wondered what she was doing for sex. It had been over a month since the incident, and Andy needed sex daily. At least I'm serious. Eric. She said, I know you better than anyone in the world. And before tonight, I've never seen you look at anyone except me that way. And when Melissa hugged you and you did that little handshake parody, her eyes almost rolled back in her head. When you guys made contact, when you stopped hugging her, I thought her daggers were going to shred that suit. But that's not the real problem, is it? What is the real problem, Andy? I snapped. Are you afraid of not being in control of the situation? You get to go off and pick the biggest scumbag we know, who also used to be my best friend, and screw them on my deck in broad daylight. But you want to get to choose who I have sex with to make sure it isn't someone who threatens you. Is that the problem? No, Eric, she said. That's not the problem. The problem is that to me, there's a difference between love and sex. I could go out tonight and have sex with three guys, and you'd still be the only man that I love. I can separate the two, you can't. If you have sex with Melissa, I'll lose you for good. I'm sure of it. Eventually, I'll run out of curiosity, and you and I will settle down. Things will be wonderful again, and we'll have all the things that we want. But if you and Melissa have sex, things won't ever be the same, Eric. I know I shouldn't ask you this, but can I sleep with you tonight? I know you still think I'm damaged, so I know you don't want to have sex with me. But it's been so long since I had a good night's sleep and felt safe and warm. Okay. Andy? I hurt myself, she said as she dropped the rope, revealing her nakedness underneath. Then she climbed into bed next to me. Over the next few minutes, she slowly moved closer until we were almost touching. I felt one of her feet tentatively touch mine and then start inching its way across my legs. Andy, just stop wiggling around and get comfortable, I snapped. Are you sure you want me to be comfortable, she asked quietly. I said so, didn't I? It came out far harsher than I'd intended, but somehow the tone didn't seem to matter. Okay, said Andy. I could hear the happiness in her voice. The next thing I knew, she'd swung one of those long legs over mine, and her left arm was wrapped around me. Her left jug was resting on my upper abdomen, and its softness was tickling the hair on my stomach. The biggest problem was that this position had her left leg in contact with my tool, and her box was in contact with my left leg. I could feel the heat coming from it, and I'm sure Andy could feel me swelling. This is so much better. Andy CD I've missed this for so long. This is the way I'm supposed to sleep. Are you sure there's nothing you want to say or do before? We drifted off. I was thinking a lot of things right then, rolling over and taking my box back was chief among them. I started to say something, and my arm rubbed against her jug. Oh, exclaimed Andy. Sorry, that was an accident, I snapped. Don't be sorry, said Andy. I didn't mind at all. That was the problem, I realized I don't think she cared who screwed her as long as she got screwed, even though I didn't see her screwing Mike. My mind was flooded with images of Andy having sex with Mike in all different positions. All of a sudden, my tool shrank, and I was uncomfortable being close to her. I rolled over in the opposite direction with my back to her and no contact. Sorry, I'm not comfortable sleeping on my back. I whispered good night, Andrea as I drifted off to sleep. 
I heard her quietly sobbing, and I felt bad about the way things were between us. I also felt guilty because she was clearly trying hard to fix things in our relationship, and I had adopted a very casual attitude about it. I guess my mind just said, let's just wait and see. If it works, it does, if not, we tried early. The next morning, I dreamed that Melissa was giving me a job. It shocked me because, until that point, I'd actually never had a sexual thought about Melissa. Seeing her in that swimsuit the previous night had definitely put her on my radar. Though in the dream, Mel stopped sucking me and mounted me. She slowly lowered her steaming hot box over my tool until our pubic bones were touching, then she started to ride me in small, short strides. What I liked was that, as if we'd been screwing each other for years, I reached up to feel those big jugs that I'd been so enthralled with at the pool last night and couldn't find them. All I felt was a small per jug with a rock-hard duck. In a second, I realized what was going on and grabbed Andy by her shoulders and pulled her off of me. What the hell is wrong with you, Andy? I screamed at her, I'm sorry, I just wanted you so badly. She cried, and you liked it and you needed it too. I was asleep. Andy. I didn't know what was going on. My mind keeps going back to a time before all of this happened, back when there were only us back before you screwed us up. We were so happy then, and in the dream I was having, it was like old times when we couldn't get enough of each other. I was lying through my teeth, but telling her that I was dreaming about screwing Melissa would have only made things worse. The surprising thing was that I had never lied to Andy before then, and I guess. I should have felt guilty about it, but I really didn't. That didn't bode well for the relationship. So, why can't we just pretend that it's still like that, she cried. We pretend that we're past all of my curiosity and the damage it did to us. That way, we could undo all of this and get back to just us. Andy, I'm not that good at pretending, I said. You want me to pretend that you didn't screw Mike? Pretend that we hadn't talked about it beforehand? Pretend that you didn't just screw over ten years of friendship, trust, and love because you were curious about what another tool would feel like? Okay, Andrea, since you're so good at games, hold out your hands and close your eyes. Andy held her hands up in front of her. Remember the way we used to feel about each other, run that through your mind. Remember the closeness. Imagine the fact that I loved you so much, I couldn't stand to be away from you. I would have done anything for you. I'd have chewed my arm off to get to you. Having sex with you was the greatest thing in the world. Every inch of your body was a treasure to me, Andy. I always had the feeling that if you ever died, even if it wasn't from sickness or disease or old age, even if it was something stupid like a car accident, that I'd die soon after. I'd have to, because I was simply not capable of living without you. Can you feel that, Andrea? I smirked, putting all of those feelings in one hand. Even in the dark, I could see Andy smiling. Now, for the other hand have you noticed the distance between us now? Have you noticed that I still have trouble being in the same room with you for more than a few minutes? I really tried last night, but sometimes you still make my skin crawl when you touch me. Do you understand that, Andy? When I come home now, I don't run through the house trying to find you because I can't bear to be away from you anymore. Sometimes, I find myself praying that you're out visiting someone. But then I wonder who you're visiting and whether or not you're screwing them. Every time you brush up against me, even by accident, I need to take about a hundred showers before I feel clean. At this point, if you were in an accident, I don't know whether I'd even feel sad, let alone die. In some ways, I know that you're trying to save our marriage, Andrea, but I can't help feeling that maybe it would be better if we just let it die. If we go our separate ways, it'll hurt me for a while, but I was almost over it. I'm not sure that it would even hurt you because you were so eager to risk throwing it away so you could screw Mike. I don't trust you anymore, and I'm not sure that I ever will again. Melissa says it'll take time, but I don't think we can ever get back what we had. And I wonder if I wouldn't be better off looking for something like that with someone else than settling for a pale imitation of it with you. In short, we're like a broken glass, Andrea. All of the water is flowing out of the hole, only it's not water flowing out, it's my love for you. Unless we find some way to plug the leak, it's all going to be gone. Andy's smile had now faded, and she was crying again. Compare those two sets of feelings, Andy. I snapped, which one do you like better? The first one, she said quietly. That's what I want back so badly. I'd do anything to have that back. And despite what you think, we're going to get it. It may take a little time and a lot of work, but I promise you, when this is all done, we'll be back there, and we'll be stronger. 
Something in what she just said set my alarm bells off, but I didn't pay them any attention. So, Andrea, think about that second hand. The way things are now feels like, I began. I said I don't want to, she interrupted. I don't like it. I hate it. But you need to really run it through your mind, Andy. It's really important to us for you to know that, I said, seriously. But why? It's ugly, and I don't feel like you love me anymore, she snapped. Because, Andy, it's what you wanted to find out from the start, I said. That's what another tool feels like. Now you know. I went into the shower and got ready to go to work, leaving Andy in bed, sobbing. I hated to be so hard on her, but none of this seemed to be getting through to her. Several of the things she'd said had filled me with dread and uncertainty. She'd said, when all of this is over, and in another conversation, she'd said, when my curiosity is all done. She'd also told me, next time, I won't be dishonest. Over the next few weeks, things slowly improved between me and Andy. We got back to the point where I was able to stay in the same room with her, and we even spent time sitting next to each other on the deck after dinner. Mel joined us sometimes, which always made Andy jealous, but I could tell she was trying not to say anything. She hated the fact that Mel and I still spend a lot of time together. Have you screwed her yet? Andy asked me one night out of the blue. She was really angry because she'd seen me hug Mel after one of our runs. We had just completed our first 10-miler, and we were just two friends congratulating each other for a big accomplishment. But Andy's jealousy got out of hand. If I had you, you probably wouldn't still be here, I replied. Andy burst into tears and ran away. Later, she came out on the deck. I'm sorry, she said. It just hurts sometimes. I've been back in our house for almost three months, and things are better between us. I can feel that but you still won't even touch me, let alone have sex with me. But then I see you hugging her, and I know that to you, it's just a buddy hug. But if you saw the way the two of you looked into each other's eyes and embraced, you'd understand. Why do I want to strangle that witch? Now you know why Mike and I will never be friends again. I said the difference is that I only hugged Mel in public with all of our clothes on. You let Mike screw you, yes, I did, she snapped. I let Mike screw me. So now I'm damaged goods forever, and the only man I love, the one who promised to love me forever, won't even touch me. Do you know why I hate Melissa so much now? It's not just the fact that you guys are friends, it's because I would literally die to have you hug me the way you just hugged her. The two of you are so easy together, so confident and comfortable around each other. Mike and I aren't like that, and as you never stop bringing up, he screwed me. He and I had sex, and it hasn't made us nearly as close as you and Melissa are. But in your mind, love and sex are connected. Where's the connection between Mike and me? We hate each other now because we screwed up and... It's cost us our happiness, Eric. If I let someone drive your precious Mustang, you would be pissed. Let's say it was one of our neighbors who really wanted to see what driving it was like, so I let him drive it around the block one time, less than a mile, so your odometer doesn't even change. He doesn't damage the car, and you wouldn't have even known, except for the fact that you came home and saw him pulling into the driveway. How would you react to that? I know you'd be pissed at me, of course, but let's not talk about your feelings towards me, let's talk about how you'd feel about your precious car. I could see you getting angry just at the thought of it because we both knew that I'd probably kill him, cut the body up into small pieces, and bury them all over the country. No one touched my Mustang. You'd probably wash the car two or three times, inside and out, recondition the leather with some of your armor all leather cleaner. Even though he's only sat in the driver's seat, you'd do all of the seats in the interior. You'd do the driver's seat twice, maybe three times. You'd do the steering wheel and everything else he touched at least three times. You'd be angry as hell. It would probably take a couple of days, maybe even a week, but I doubt that. But then you'd drive that car again, wouldn't you? You couldn't help it. You love that car. So even if someone else just spoiled your precious car, you'd drive it again. You wouldn't have keys to it ever again, and if I didn't drive it, I'd reprogram the garage door so no one could even get near it. But I guess I would drive it again. I admit it. So why won't you drive me, she snapped. Mike screwed me for five goddamn minutes one time. I keep telling you there was nothing special about it. I didn't even like it. I was only curious. I've taken hundreds of showers since then, but you still haven't even kissed me, and it's been three months. Not even a peck. You told me a few weeks ago that having sex with me was the 
greatest thing you could think of. If you go back to driving the car again, why can't we go back to having sex? A hug like the one you just gave Melissa would at least give me some hope, Eric, I said slowly. How about tonight? I said, smiling as I pulled out my iPhone. You're going to hug me tonight, she asked hopefully. I thought you wanted to be driven, I smiled. I thought you wanted to have sex, she said, excitedly bouncing up and down. It's for you, I said, handing her my phone. When she heard Mike's voice over the phone, her whole face turned red, and she flung it as hard as she could. That's how I lost that iPhone. The end of the summer was coming up, and Andy and I decided to throw a party with just a few friends, neighbors, and some family members. Melissa was invited, which made Andy really pissed, but Mike wasn't, which made me really happy. Her parents, siblings, and their spouses were coming. We were very busy planning it and buying food and supplies for the party when it happened. Mel and I had just come back from a run. I was watching her bum as she went into the house to shower when I noticed Mike jump over the fence into my yard. Andy had told me that she would be out for a while doing some shopping for the party, so I knew she wasn't home. What the hell was he doing going into my yard when neither Andy nor I was home? I followed him, and I swear to God, I thought he was trying to steal something from me or borrow one of my tools without asking because he knew that I'd never loan him anything ever again. Mike didn't stop in my yard, he hopped the fence into George and Sandy Cooper's yard. I waited for a few minutes and followed him. He walked right into their house without knocking. I pulled out my new iPhone 4, I got it to replace the iPhone 3GS that Andy had thrown. I crept up to the window. I was sure that Mike was screwing Sandy Cooper now, and the video would help Mel get rid of his cheating husband for good. Sandy Cooper wasn't home, but George was. He and two other guys were screwing Andy at the same time. Last time you wanted to try double penetration with George, this time you're getting three at a time, which should take care of your curiosity. I'm next, said Mike. No Mike I already screwed you once you weren't any good and you screwed up my marriage, said Andy. I almost lost Eric because of you, Andy. I just wanted to see if I could make you scream the way that he does. I almost lost Melissa too, she hasn't screwed me since then. At least you get screwed. Mike it isn't the same snapped Andy, I just wanted to try the group thing out of curiosity. I really don't feel anything except for a lot of rubbing and thrusting. These guys can't do it either to get me to have an orgasm, they have to eat me or masturbate me no matter how hard they pound me with their tools. It isn't doing anything. There must be something to Eric's theory about love and sex, but Andy. If you don't screw me, I'll tell Eric you did this, and at least then he might forgive me and talk to Mel for me. I only screwed you once, this is George's third time, and the second time you've done more than one guy, said Mike. This is never going to happen again. My curiosity is all settled, said Andy. After tonight, no one but Eric will ever touch me, so if that's what it takes to shut you up, I'll let you stick your tiny little tool in me for five more minutes. Unlike these guys, you won't even need a condom since you only shoot blanks. I didn't stay long enough to see Mike get his turn. God damn it, I thought I was all crying out over Andy, but I wasn't. I ran into the house and started packing everything that I needed. I was loading my suitcase into the Mustang when Melissa came out of her house. Eric, what's wrong? She asked. I gave her the phone and hit the play button. Eric, I'm so sorry. She said she was crying too, and. I could tell she meant it. Where are you taking her this time? Back to her parents' house? No, Mel. I'm leaving this time. There's no way back from this one. I just need to get away while I start hiding my assets to limit my exposure in the divorce. Believe it or not, I'll probably miss you more than I'll miss that cheating 304. I said, no, you won't. Don't say things that aren't true, she said. Wait a minute. I need to get something, Mel ran into her house and came back with a suitcase. She threw it in the trunk next to mine and said, let's go. I looked at her in shock. I told you a long time ago that I was getting rid of Mike. This is as good a time as any, she said, unless you don't want me to come with you. I hadn't given any thought to where I'd go, so we drove around for a while and ended up eating at the lake as it started to get dark. We still hadn't made any plans. I told Mel that we'd have to check into a motel. I saw the first of those awful romantic couples strolling along the waterfront. I was so enraged that I grabbed my supersized soda and heaved it at them. It would have hit them too if Mel hadn't grabbed my arm and made the throw go off target as soon as. We got back in the car, my phone started ringing. 
I saw that it was Andy and let it go to voicemail. We drove to the nearest hotel we could find. It turned out to be the Summit Inn, a little pricey, but at least we wouldn't have to worry about hookers. I'd seen enough 304s on my phone tonight to last me a lifetime, which really was funny because I'd always thought I was going to spend my lifetime with a 304 on my phone. Mel and I stepped up to the desk and put our suitcases down. A few seconds later, a gangly old man got behind the desk. Hey, mister, your wife sure is pretty, he said. I looked at him strangely and said, my wife is a cheating blonde 304. She's the ugliest which I can think of because of it. Her hair isn't blonde. He looked puzzled. Suddenly, I realized he was talking about Mel. I smiled and said, yeah, you're right. She really is pretty. She's the most beautiful woman I know. We need two rooms, I said. One, said Melissa. Neither of us should be alone tonight. Oh boy, we're in trouble, I said as we stepped into the room. There's only one bed. Melissa started laughing. Eric, whether you know it or not, you're my best friend. I trust you totally. We'll be fine, whatever happens. But we need to have a talk. I didn't know whether to run out of the room or not. Whenever a woman says we need to have a talk, or any words to that effect, it's always serious. Before we got started with our talk, Melissa's phone rang. I'm curious about what the a-hole has to say, she said. To tell you the truth, I didn't think he'd even notice that I was gone. Oh boy, she said suddenly. What? I asked. Wrong AO, she replied. She put the phone on speaker and held her finger up to her lips, meaning for me to listen but not to say anything. I nodded my head. Hello? Andrea said. Melissa, said Melissa. Andrea, I hate to bother you, but can you come over here? I really need someone to talk to right now, said Andy. Andrea, I'm not at home right now. I'm back at work, so I can't come over. Can it wait until tomorrow, said Melissa, smiling. Besides, you and I are not exactly friends, so are you sure I'm the person you should be talking to? Mel, I'm really sorry for what I did to you with Mike. I'll do anything to make it up to you. I'll give you anything you want, just name it. You are the person I need to talk to more than anyone else, said Andy. Why is that, Andrea, asked Mel. Because you know more than I do right now what Eric is thinking or where he might be going, said Andy. Melissa, Eric just ran off. I don't know where he is or when he'll be back. Last time we fought and he threw me out, there was a reason for it, as you know. I had done something awful. But this time, I don't have a clue why he'd just leave me, whined Andy. Melissa and I were trying our best not to laugh. We've been slowly getting closer again, Andy said sadly. It's been really hard for me, but I'm trying my best because I love him so much. We're even planning a party together for the day after tomorrow. I went out to do some shopping while you guys had your run. I spoke to Mike, and he said you and Eric went running as usual. Mike is really jealous of that, you know. Anyway, he said he heard you coming back into the house, so we knew you guys came home. I guess that's when you went back to work. Where did Eric go, she whined. It's only 9.30. Maybe he just went out for a drive. When you and my a-hole of a husband were planning your little fest, Eric went out and drove his car every night. Remember that? Andrea said. It always seems so stupid to me. Why? He likes to drive that car. I used to think that after me, that car was his favorite thing on this earth. Right now, I'm pretty sure that car is ahead of me, said Andy. I wasn't saying it was stupid for him to go out and drive the car, Andy. I was saying that you were stupid, said Melissa. Eric is a really great guy. He loves you so much. Do you know how lucky you are? Most women would die to have someone treat them like he treats you. When we used to be friends, you told me all the time about how great you were together. Why would you risk that to screw around with my lazy husband? That's what's stupid, said Mel. Lately, I've been wishing I was you, said Andy. I got really jealous a few weeks ago after listening to him talking about how great you are. I saw him hug you, and I just wanted to kill you, Melissa. I'll never let anyone come between us. Anyway, I did something really stupid, and I regret it, but I'll have to handle that later. I hope you're right. His car is gone, so maybe he did just go for a drive. If you hear from him, please let me know, she said. I told you, said Melissa, hanging up the phone. That a-hole doesn't even know or care that I'm gone. 
at least Andrea is worried sick about you. My own husband doesn't give a flying idea about where I am or even if I'm coming home. I hugged Melissa to comfort her. After a few minutes, she was okay. Why don't you go ahead and take your shower while I make a few phone calls, she said. I figured that she wanted to be alone for a while, so I headed for the shower. I came out wearing long boxers and a t-shirt. Somehow, I didn't feel weird about being around Melissa in my underwear. It was probably because the boxers and shirt were very similar to what we both wore when we ran together every day. Eric, turn the lights out, yelled Melissa. I did, and then she came out of the bathroom and got into bed. I thought we were going to have a talk, I reminded her. We may as well talk tomorrow, she said. I don't want to harm your virtue. How is talking harming my virtue? We talk all the time. You're the person I'm the most comfortable talking to, I said. If we turn the lights back on, I don't think we'll get much talking done because I'm kind of naked, said Melissa. And even though our spouses gave us permission to do it, I'm not sure. If that's a good idea, but I did figure out what I want from Andrea to make all of my hurts go away. Before I could even ask what it was, Melissa told me she'd never tell me. It was as if she'd read my mind. That was the way that Andy and I used to be. I missed it. Sometime during the night, the inevitable rolling occurred. For some reason, human beings in a bed exhibit a lot of the same principles as magnets. I think that, with the exception of gay and or lesbian individuals, all men are positively charged and all women are negatively charged. If you put two men or two women in a bed together, they end up rolling as far away from each other as they can in staying there, this is because similar charges repel. But if you put a man and a woman in bed together, they seem to always end up together. It was still dark when I realized that Melissa was in front of me a microsecond later. I realized that my tool was in the crack in her bum. Melissa had lost a lot of weight over the last four months, but she still had a lot more bum than Andy would ever have. Andy had that tight little bikini bum that most men claim to like. Andy's bum was also as hard as a rock. Melissa's, on the other hand, was soft and pliable, and my tool was getting harder by the second and pushing its way further into it. I couldn't risk any sudden moves because I didn't want her to think I was trying something. Another microsecond went by before I realized that my tool wasn't the only thing wandering. My arm was lying across Mel's shoulder, and my hand was on one of those large, soft jugs. I don't think I'd ever felt anything so soft and warm in my entire life. That realization only served to enlarge my tool more. Then I realized that Melissa's hand was on top of mine, pressing it onto her. It wasn't my tool pressing into MK, but she was pushing it against me. Sorry, she said, moving her hand off of mine. I couldn't help it. I've wanted you for so long, but I didn't want it to be like this, like what I asked. I didn't want you to just screw me as some kind of revenge reaction to get back at Mike and Andy. I didn't want to take advantage of you because you're vulnerable or because you're devastated over finding out that the woman you love is a sociopathic round-heeled 304 who's probably a snake to satisfy her curiosity, especially the thing she's looking for. She had it from the beginning, she said. Melissa, shut the hell up. I snapped. You're totally wrong. I know it's still hard for you to hear bad things about Andy, Eric, but she's not good for you anymore, said Melissa. No, I said, you said, the woman I love is a sociopathic, round-heeled 304 who'd probably screw a snake to satisfy her curiosity. I'm not about to let you talk about yourself that way, I said, starting to move my hand from her jug, since her hand was no longer holding it in place. Who told you to move your hand, she smiled. I had it right where I wanted it. I pulled her to me and started rubbing her sides. Oh yeah, take it easy on me, it's been a long time, she said I started nibbling her back and shoulders, and she loved it. I worked my way down and started licking her soft round bum. While doing this, I noticed that the months of running had taken their toll, and there was no longer any flab around her abdominal region. My questing fingers continued their walk up her torso, and I avoided her jocks. Hey, aren't you going to rub me? She began to forget about. What I was going to say she hissed, just keep doing what you're doing. Melk's legs had ceased flopping around on me and were currently around my neck, nearly choking the life out of me. Eric, don't stop. She cried. That's so good. I took note of the fact that Mel was rubbing and squeezing her own jugs, unlike Andrea, who seemed to need more attention given to them. I filed that away for next time while I was thinking about it. I reached around her with one of my arms and started to squeeze her jug. DRS, and rub her engorged dugs. 
I took tiny bites on her neck while we started screwing with long, slow, easy strikes. We took her time. I don't think either of us was even remotely interested in anything like what we'd seen on my phone. This wasn't about getting off. It was about getting into the meaning inside of each other's hearts and heads while our bodies did what bodies do. Do you like it? She asked quietly, and I replied that we kept it up for a long time, and it was really special, not just because I hadn't done anything that didn't require my hand in months, but because this was the beginning of something extraordinary a little while longer. I started to pull out and warn Melissa, but she wrapped her arm behind me and pushed me back in. Don't stop Eric, I want it inside me. She said I thought that meant that she was on the pill or safe, and really I wanted it too. I wanted to just coat her insides with my baby batter and make this woman mine at that moment. I didn't care about Mike, Andrea, or anyone else except for Mel and me. I just let go and fired line after line of sperm in her unprotected walls. After that, Melissa just rolled over and smiled at me. She started kissing me gently and thanked me. What are you thanking me for? I have never done anything like that ever, she said emphatically, what Mike and I did was never like that. Andrea was a fool. She went back to kissing me, and that's how we fell asleep. I slept like a log, all of the stress of the past few months was gone. Actually, what woke me up was Mel saying, Eric, I have to pee. I noticed that unlike when I slept with Andy, this time I was the one who was wrapped around Mel, one arm over her jugs and one leg over hers. Are you trying to lay claim on me or just making sure I don't try to escape? She asked. Definitely the first one, I said. Well, you need to know that I'm temporarily a married woman, she laughed, but I intend to take care of that immediately and then I'll be accepting offers. I'd offer you my heart and a place in my life forever from this moment forward, I said seriously. I'll take it, she smiled. I'm off the market, she went into the bathroom and peed. Then I heard the shower start, and I jumped out of bed and ran in. I opened the door and got in behind her, and started rubbing my hands slowly down her sides. Eric, what about Andy, she asked. Andy who? I replied. Are you going to be doing a lot of nasty things to me today? She asked. Nope, I said. Oh, she replied. She seemed kind of disappointed. I'm going to be doing nasty things to you every day, I said. We spent the morning calling into work and taking some vacation time. We called my lawyer and set up an appointment to see him. Then we spent the rest of the day in bed doing those aforementioned nasty things. Sometime that afternoon, I was going to call room service and remembered my phone. My voicemail was full, and I had over 50 texts from Andy. Melissa had a couple of calls from Mike and at least 10 from Andy. We couldn't stay at the hotel for too long, but during the day I had an idea. Mel and I could move into the underground house. I got the power and utilities turned on, and we spent the rest of the day shopping for things we'd need and moved in that evening. Which bedroom are you taking? asked Mel. I'd hope to be in the one with you in it, I said. Smart man, said Mel. We spent the evening making plans. We had two divorces to begin and other things to do. We decided to confront our cheating spouses at the party that Andy and I were supposed to be having. Since she would obviously cancel the party, we started making a few calls to make sure the people we needed would be there. I had a few plans to make for myself. I had a friend who bought one of those decommissioned squad cars at a police auction. He'd never been able to drive it on the street because he hadn't gotten around to getting the local PD's colors and badges off of it. I also had a couple of friends who owed me a favor and were willing to do anything to get rid of that debt. At 7 p.m., guests started arriving at my house. Fortunately, Andy's parents were the first to arrive. Mom, Dad, I had to cancel the party tonight, said Andy. She'd been crying and didn't look well. I know, said her mom, but Eric called and said we should probably all talk after the party, so we're here. Please tell me that you didn't sleep with another guy while you were barely avoiding a divorce from the first time, Andrea. You couldn't have been that stupid, could you? Andy just looked away from her mother. Sandy Cooper was next to arrive, but George wasn't with her, he was on his way, though, she said. Andy found out that Eric had invited the Coopers as well. She wondered why. Mike showed up a few minutes later with a confused look on his face. He looked around and finally asked Andy where Melissa was. Sally Stevens and her husband Kurt, and Andy's brother and his wife, were the next to arrive. Tom and Esther Jenkins had called and said they'd be late. Esther wanted to come badly, but Tom seemed to be dragging his feet. 
There was also another couple who no one seemed to recognize that claimed to have been invited by Eric, but they didn't arrive until nearly 8 o'clock. Sandy couldn't figure out where George was or what was taking him so long to arrive. George was in hell at 7 o'clock when Sandy was pulling up in Eric and Andy's driveway. A police car had pulled George over. They made him get out of his car and handcuffed him with his hands behind his back. Then they put him in the back of the squad car and drove around asking him questions. George was sure it was a case of mistaken identity. He couldn't see his watch with his hands behind his back, but he could see that it was beginning to get dark. He knew that Sandy would worry. He asked if he could call his wife. The officers told him that he'd get his phone call after he was booked and charged. He hadn't been arrested yet, only detained, so he sat tight. George looked at the clock on the squad car's dashboard and saw that it was nearly 8.15. He could have sworn that he'd only been in the car for 20 minutes or so. What George didn't realize was that every time he looked away, the officers moved the dashboard clock ahead 15 minutes. Finally, they drove out to a deserted area and waited. When the dashboard clock read 8.55, the radio squawked and one of the officers started speaking into it. What the hell do you mean you caught him, screamed the officer. We've got the scum sucker right here in the back of our goddamn squad car. George wondered what was going on. Okay buddy, you were right, it's a case of mistaken identity. Sorry to interrupt your night, as the officer uncuffed George. He seemed to be taking a long time to get the cuffs off. Actually, he was resetting George's watch to match the time, 9.05, on the squad car's dashboard. You're free to go, sir, said the officer. What do you mean I'm free to go, said George. You've driven me way out of my neighborhood and held me for two hours, and now you're just going to leave me here? Sorry, sir, we're not allowed to carry civilians in the squad car unless they're part of an investigation or a crime, said the cop as he and his partner drove off. Hey, there's a gas station over there. Call someone to come and get you. Have a pleasant evening, sir. George could have sworn he heard the cops laughing as they drove off. He looked down at his watch. It was after 9 p.m. As George started walking towards the gas station, a guy in a mask stepped out from behind a boarded-up shop. He started walking towards George. Hey buddy. I don't have any money, or even my wallet, said George. The man didn't talk, he just walked up to George and, without saying a word, punched him in the face so hard that George was stunned. He staggered back and tried to put his hands up while he waited for his equilibrium to stabilize. What the hell, said George. The man punched him again, even harder. George tried to talk, but his jaw hurt. He looked up just in time to get another punch, that third punch knocked him off his feet. George thought the fight was over and that he'd lost. This was the first time he'd gotten his bum so thoroughly kicked. George was wrong, though, the fight was only beginning. The man came over and started kicking George. He kicked him in the side several times, and George was sure he felt ribs snap. Then, that pain was eclipsed as the man found a new target, George's nuts. George screamed so loudly that he was sure he could be heard in the next state. Then the man kicked George several times in each leg, but it didn't matter because George had blacked out from the pain. He vaguely remembered being dragged down the street and left very close to the gas station. In one of his moments of awareness, he didn't know how long. It wasn't until someone found him and called an ambulance, but it seemed like forever. Even though George had been fooled into believing that his bum kicking had started at 9 o'clock, it was actually only 8 o'clock. At 8.45, Eric's Mustang pulled into the driveway. He and Melissa got out and went into the house and out onto the deck. He saw his mother-in-law and father-in-law, as well as several neighbors. He greeted his wife's family warmly and hugged Sandy Cooper. He nodded to the mysterious couple. Mike came over to talk to Melissa, but she blew him off and followed Eric around. Finally, Andy came downstairs and saw Eric. She ran over to him and tried to hug him, but he pushed her away. Eric, I forgive you for just running off on me, though I'm not sure why you did it, she said. The rest of the guests politely pretended to be doing other things but were really watching and listening intently. Wait, you didn't run off alone to think. You were with Melissa, weren't you, she said. But what? We were just starting to make progress. I was beginning to feel like you loved me a little bit again and that there was a chance for us to get past our problems, she fell to the floor and started crying. Eric started clapping his hands. Can everyone come over here for a moment, he said. Melissa had also started clapping her hands. 
Everyone, give Andy a hand, said Eric. That was the greatest acting performance in history. Now we know where Andy's true. Talents lie, I guess. Everyone here knows that Andy and I have been having a rough time in our marriage. I recently threw her out of the house for a while, Andy said. She told me that she was curious about what it would be like to have sex with another man, Eric added. I begged her not to do it, but she did anyway. She went out and screwed my former best friend, Mike, the husband of her former best friend, Melissa. It broke my heart, and I hated her for what she did to us, but I still loved her so much. For the past few weeks, we've been trying to patch up the destruction that Andy's curiosity wrought on our marriage. But it was hard for me, as Andy said we were just starting out on that long process of fixing things. When I noticed my ex-best friend going into my backyard, I followed him and recorded. What I found on my phone can everyone follow me into the den? Everyone watched as I hooked my iPhone up to the plasma screen TV. They were all shocked as they saw Mike watching as George and Kurt Stevens screwed Andy while she gave Tom Jenkins a the great thing about the iPhone 4 is that it shoots high-resolution video. The images on the screen were very clear. George's and Cut's lust and Andy's boredom at the ACT were apparent. Andy's father turned his head and begged me to stop the tape. Andy's mother vomited the contents of her stomach onto the parquet floor tiles in the den. I guess everyone kind of understands. Why I disappeared a couple of days ago, now what they can't understand is what it feels like to have the person you loved and wanted to spend the rest of your life with hurt you this way. Twice. I hope you all understand that there won't be a third time. Every bit of love I once felt for her is gone. There's only one way for us to go now. Eric stopped talking and nodded to the mysterious couple. They each produced an envelope from somewhere and handed one to Andy and one to Mike. You've been served, they told them. Tom Jenkins and Kurt Stevens were given envelopes as well. Their envelopes contained their alienation of affection suit papers. Since George wasn't present, the man asked Sandy Cooper, his wife, to please notify him that he was being sued as well. That cheating scum sucker, screamed Sandy as she walked towards the door. No wonder he stood me up. I'm divorcing his cheating scum sucker too. Everyone else headed for the door too soon. Only Mike, Melissa, Eric, Andy, and Andy's parents were still in the room. Eric, it's over. It won't ever happen again, cried Andy. You're right about that, said Eric sadly. Where are you going, screamed Andy. We have to talk about this. It can still work. I still love you. I only love you. You heard me tell them that on the tape. The only person I like having sex with was you, that was on the tape too. I just needed to find out. It was just my curiosity. She was holding onto Eric's leg as he tried to walk out. Where do you think you're going, Mike? asked Melissa. We need to talk too. I'm not happy about you going off and screwing other guys either. Even after what I did, two wrongs don't make a right, Melissa. We have bills to pay, woman, and your check didn't make it into our account. Mike reached out and grabbed Melissa's arm, turning her around. You are not leaving with him again, he snapped. We're still married, no divorce, and no more sex with other guys. Eric didn't even break his stride, he just turned around and decked Mike, then put his arm around Melissa and guided her from the room. Melissa turned as she and Eric got to the doorway. You shouldn't worry about me screwing other guys, Mike. I'd never do that. I'm faithful to the man I love. I only made love with Eric, H-E-K the guy, and there are no other guys, including you. I think I got what I wanted, Eric, said Andy's father. I have no idea what you're feeling. I can't believe my daughter is capable of doing what we saw. Take some time to cool down, and we'll all get together and work this out. Eric nodded, and he and Melissa left. It was nearly six weeks before they would all sit down together again. During that time, Eric had no contact with Andy. She called him hundreds of times, but the restraining order prevented her from going to his job, and she didn't know where he lived. She suspected that he was still with Melissa, which angered her. She was sure that Eric was falling in love with Melissa and not just having a fling. To Andy, that was simply not fair. Her curiosity had only been about sex, not love. She'd never had any intention of leaving Eric or falling in love with anyone else. During the six weeks, several notable events occurred. Andy had a breakdown of some sort. Eventually, Eric showed up with a truck to retrieve the rest of his belongings, and Melissa's Mike refused to allow Eric to get them until the police arrived. 
Eric then showed them a court order allowing him to take Melissa's things. Where is that 304? I asked Mike Sheck at the doctor's today. Eric smiled. What did you do? I asked Mike to screw her until her uterus fell out. Just hearing someone talk about Eric having sex with Melissa started Andy in a fit of crying and screaming. Another interesting thing was what happened to Kurt Stevens one Sunday. Kurt was stuck at a red light when an abandoned cement truck plowed into his car, crushing. Please correct errors and punctuation, at the same time that the accident occurred, both Eric and Melissa had been in church. Eric had gotten up once during the ceremony to use the bathroom and had left the door open. An usher who was actually an off-duty police officer had seen Eric's leg and could vouch for the fact that he was on the toilet the whole time, there was some suspicion about Eric. Because when George Cooper's beating had been discovered, Eric was the only person George could think of who had a motive to want to hurt him. But at the exact time of the beating, Eric had several witnesses, including George's ex-wife, who could verify that Eric had gotten to the party before nine and didn't leave the party until long after George's beating had ended. George was sure that his beating had happened at nine o'clock. The investigating detectives were sure of it as well because even George's watch, which had been broken during the incident, had stopped when it was broken, at just after nine. Eric was ruled out. He was also ruled out in Kurt Stevens's case because he couldn't have been in the bathroom under gastric distress and driving the truck at the same time. George would probably never walk again. He also lost both testicles, his wife, and 60% of his assets. His life would never be the same. Kurt was in a coma, and no one was sure he'd ever wake up. If he did, he'd wake up single because his wife divorced him as well. Tom Jenkins didn't wait for his divorce after finding out what happened to Kurt and George, he just got in his car and drove away. He didn't even pack his clothes, he just disappeared. He spent the rest of his life looking over his shoulder, afraid to settle down or stay in one place for any length of time. He also developed a phobia about married women, he couldn't bear to be around them, no matter how innocent the situation. That was a terrible toll for a job. Andy was beautiful, but it just wasn't worth it. At our sit-down meeting, things went pretty much as Melissa and I thought. Both Mike and Andy refused to sign the divorce papers. Melissa gave Mike their house, which he couldn't afford since he wasn't working. He also couldn't afford his truck or their utilities. Mike, at 40 years old, ended up living with his parents for a while and then on the street. I offered Andy the house as well and half of our savings and checking accounts. I paid off her credit cards and offered to pay her a lump sum in lieu of alimony so I wouldn't have to have contact with her. Eric, can't the two of you work this out somehow? asked her dad. She's willing to overlook your revenge affair. We all are. We know what she put you through. I'll give up anything to have you back, said Andy. But you aren't getting this divorce. You will not have it. Besides, said Andy, Melissa looks really pretty, but her gut is coming back. Are you sure you want to be stuck with that? I laughed, reached out, and patted Andy on top of her head. Silly rabbit, that's not a gut, I said. What is it? Lucky Charms smiled Andy. Nope, it's a baby, said Melissa, rubbing her stomach. I told you I got what I wanted. Immediately after that, Mike threw up. That was when Andy checked out mentally and had to be hospitalized. I'll kill you, she screamed as she jumped across the table at Mel. That was the last time I saw her until she showed up at the hospital this morning. Melissa was still asleep, so I went down to the gift shop to get her more flowers, even though there was no room for them anywhere. I wanted her to know just how much I loved her and how special our daughter was to me. When I returned to Melissa's floor, I was greeted by a chaotic scene outside her room. Security personnel and police officers were bustling about. My heart sank as I witnessed Andy being led away in handcuffs. It later came to light that Andy had entered Melissa's room under the pretense of delivering a card. Thankfully, vigilant nurses caught Andy attempting to harm Mel on the surveillance footage. Rushing into action, they intervened, pulling Andy away and alerting security. Andy was subsequently readmitted to a mental institution for an indefinite period. While it brings relief that Andy will be away from us for a substantial duration, it's disheartening to realize that legal recourse is limited when dealing with individuals who are not mentally sound. Consequently, I remain legally bound to Andy, much to my dismay. On a brighter note, Melissa and I have reclaimed our home, where we now reside together. With the assistance of a teacher's aide, grading papers no longer consumes our evenings, affording us leisure time to cherish each other's company on our deck or during tranquil walks by the lake.
Despite the idyllic surroundings, I remain cautious of potential threats fueled by jealousy. Our daughter, Curiosity, serves as a reminder of the serendipitous nature of life. Dear listeners, life has taken a positive turn. Share your reflections in the comments below, and remember to like, share, and subscribe.